All right, we're gonna get started. Thank you all for joining us. We are so excited for the topic today and thank you for taking time out of your busy days if uh, you're on the West Coast uh, or if you are joining from you know, a different time zone, thank you for joining a little bit later in your day or even in the evening. So really, really appreciate the time you're sharing with us. Um, the topic that we're getting into today uh, is something that we've been planning for a number of months now, and it's this idea of the complicated relationship between customer success and the product. And so a lot of conversations have been had around customer success and working with product teams, but today we're going to dive into that relationship with the product itself, which we're super excited to, to dig into. Um, Grace, if we could move to the next slide. So uh, this meetup is, is presented and hosted um, by myself, Janan, Grace, and John, who couldn't be here with us today. He's on PTO, uh, well-deserved time off. Um, so we're super excited to, to bring this to you. One thing before we get into the panel itself, um, just a quick, uh, some logistics around Zoom for those that haven't joined us before. And for those that haven't used Zoom before, I'm sure there are not too many left out there, but um, please, as a reminder, stay on mute as we go through the panel, um, use the chat to engage in the discussion. And then we have a Slido link that we will be sharing in the Zoom chat. Please use that to submit your questions. We will be saving some time at the end for open audience q and I know that's everybody's favorite part. Um, and actually one thing before I forget, um, one thing that we always love to do as part of these meetups that's a little bit harder now that we're, we're virtual is um, you know, connecting those that are looking to find jobs and customer success to those that are hiring. And so one thing it, that I'd like to ask is if you are working in a company that is hiring for customer success roles, please share uh, you know, those job postings in the Zoom chat and then also this, we have um, set up a sponsorship or a partnership with Ganger Retain. So we are super, super excited for that. Um, please post your jobs onto Ganger Retain's uh, job board that they just launched recently. So with that, um, this wouldn't be possible without the partnership with Gain, Grow, Retain. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about Gain, Grow, Retain. Awesome, thanks, Junian. Uh, yeah, so if anybody's interested, we've got an open and free community that we started uh, last year. Uh, so gaingrowretain.com, we have a ton of discussion threads, kind of your traditional uh, forum community. And so there's uh, a ton of stuff happening. I think we've got 5,200 members. So it's pretty active, pretty consistent. Uh, we do weekly office hours calls on Tuesdays for CSMs, Thursdays for leaders. Um, so feel free to join one of those. We've got a podcast that we have going. Um, so really all of it's open and free to the community, trying to, to push things forward. Um, we'd love to partner with San Francisco Customer Success Meetup um, to help you know, put on some of these events, uh, knowing that it's all virtual. Hopefully one day we'll be, uh, we'll be back in person doing this in San Francisco in somebody's awesome office. I uh, would love to, to be out there for when that happens, but um, please feel free to come join the community and, and hop in wherever you can. Uh, we're always looking for people to uh, come participate and engage. So uh, feel free to do so and appreciate you all giving us the opportunity to help and excited to hear today's panel. All right, we'll hand it over to you, Grace. Hi, um, I'm so excited to welcome this group of customer success leaders today. We have Stephen, who's the head of customer experience at Miro. We have Amara, regional manager of customer success at Okta, and also Cindy, product manager at Keep Trucking. So I'm just going to start with um, digging into everyone's background a little bit. Uh, starting with Stephen. Stephen, you have experience in several roles that focus on different parts of the customer journey, including account management, solutions architect, customer success, and now customer experience. What are some highlights um, you'd like to share with us in terms of your career progression? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it's a very personal one. Yeah, I started more on the technical side, uh, but I've just been following what the opportunity and what my uh, interests were. Uh, right, so starting from a from a technical role and seeing what the potential impact could be on customers, um, and that's how I ended up in customer success. And by the way, for everybody joining, uh, customer experience at Miro is the customer success department. So it includes customer success management, uh, support, technical support, renewals, and uh, and a couple of other functions. So just to to clarify that. 
Awesome. Um, thanks, Stephen. It's um, helpful to kind of hear you articulate the different functions, um, starting from technical and also like different definitions to how customer experience um, embodies customer success as well. Um, and now on to Amara. Amara, you, um, I saw started kind of as an account executive transitioning into customer success and also leadership roles over time. Could you tell us a little bit more about your journey into leadership? Yeah. Um... So I started off in uh, my career in sales and software sales. I worked at Oracle for about five years, um, started off selling our uh, HR product suite. And I think for me, the moment where I decided, you know, I really wanted to be more in customer success was, you know, I, I sold a deal in higher ed, which is a very, as many of us know, is a fairly difficult uh, vertical, very lots of rigid policies and processes. And when their CHRO came out to take her daughter to orientation week at Berkeley, she reached out to me and she's like, can you give us a tour of the Oracle campus? And we actually took a selfie together in front of Larry Elson's pond, her and her daughter. And like, for me, that was the moment I was like more about the relationship than just closing the deal. And so when there was an opportunity that presented itself to grow a, um, a CSM org for a more recent acquisition, I took that. Um, and then found my way to Okta, which has been amazing and was recently promoted to managing a team of amazing CSMs in the Bay Area. Awesome. Um, I love the call out on being opportunistic um, for these moments that really can advance your career. Um, finally, we have uh, Cindy. Um, you spent some time as a CSM and then you progressed into your current role actually as a product manager. So could you share a little more about what brought you closer towards working directly with the product over time? Yeah, I think um, it's been really exciting development, at least in the past year, shifting from customer success to product. I think being in customer success, everyone here knows you're on the front lines consistently. You hear all the feedback you're getting from the customers, but unfortunately you're not in a position where you can do anything about it. So I think naturally for me, similar to what Amara was saying, when the opportunity came for me to join the product team, I was really excited to be able to translate all the hard work that I've been putting in on the customer success team, but actually moves into execution phase where I can take the feedback and all the product requests enhancements to further make sure our product can continue to grow and make the business continue to grow as well. So it's been really fun to say the least for the past year. So great. Um, I appreciated the call out on those moments for when you feel like you can't really do um, anything with the feedback that's given. And that's exactly what we're going to dive into today. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. This is a topic I've personally reflected on quite a bit, just this complex relationship between our role as trusted advisors for the customer, um, but also balancing that of defending the product when it comes down to it. So um, as we all know, customer success is all about helping our customers achieve their definition of success with our product. So let's start by exploring what kind of relationship we need to have with our customers to make that happen. At a very high level, um, what would you say are the attitudes that are most important for your customers to have about your company? I'd probably say excited is the word that comes to mind. You know, when you have a customer who's excited about the direction, um, you know, you're going to have them be generally fairly understanding, like you're not always going to be able to give them the great news, but if, as long as you can keep them excited and you're bringing, you know, any representation of your company to a customer meeting is very passionate about what you're doing, why you're doing it, um, getting and keeping your customer excited, I think would be really top of mind for me. Maybe I have a, a little bit of a different view on it, but, um, I'd, it would be amazing if customers or users would be excited um, or, you know, there are a lot of people who say the goal of customer success is to have happy customers. But I, I for example, I think Salesforce is a fantastic product that that's a tremendous amount of value, but I wouldn't describe myself as being very excited uh, about that product, but I would still definitely use it. So like the, I think the goal of CS is to, help um the, the customers and the users realize value and they're added things on top which would be great if they're advocates right or they're excited about it and if your brand resonates with them as a company and as a, as a product um, but i think it's more important to have a business impact for them um, rather than that yeah there's there are additional effects on top of it 
Yeah, so I'm hearing um, a desire to be ex have your customers stay excited about the product, but also um, there's a larger piece here where uh, it's maybe uh, more around business impact and value. Um, and when you're thinking about you know wanting to maintain the brand um, of the company for your customers, and let's think about the people on the front lines. Um, what would you say makes the relationship between a customer success manager and their customer really successful? I think for me, it would be communication is really key. So going on to what Steven was mentioning, um, brand values ever more so important now, especially because people really think about, you know, how they see your company as a whole. And in building these relationships, you have to have communication in order to do that. So I think being on the front lines, the customer success manager is the one that's responsible for being the face of the product to the customer. So whether it's being able to keep customers informed and making sure that they're always remaining in the know for what's happening at the company, even if it's not even feature related, it could be how the business is doing and things like that. I think that will really go a long way and help solidifying these relationships and building a better brand recognition for the company. Yeah, I think to add to you know what Cindy mentioned, consistency. I think consistency in your interactions with your customers that you're there for them when you know things are you know ideally when things are good, but also when you know things go bad. Um, being consistently available for your customers really goes a long way in maintaining uh, their trust in you um, and the company overall. Grace, I think it depends on what type of. Uh, customer success or success role that you have because many companies now as they're scaling right they have different grades and segments uh, of customers and the way that you interact with them and the time that you have for them is very different right but it can still provide a lot of value to customers so I, I think every customer would like to get the same type of value or impact from the product that's the reason why they buy and they're, they're using it uh, but the way that customer success can, it can impact that will be different so if you're you know, very well or like super big enterprise uh, company with like uh, uh, multi-million dollar deals, you probably have dedicated very, um, you know, hopefully intimate relationships uh, with that customer, knows their, know their goals inside out, know have are multi-threaded in the organization and you can really make a, a difference for your product there. But if you're in skilled success, which I know many companies do today, right? It's like you need to like, really make choices and prioritize which customers are in trouble or which customers have opportunity how do you go after that you can't go as deep in the relationship i think both can be valuable but they have different traits of like what is value to a customer and like how do you achieve that yeah i, I actually really um appreciate that call out even within customer success of course there are accounts that we choose to be more high touch with and others that maybe require skilled servicing and our interactions with those customers would probably look really different even if the the goal is the same um so i think we can all agree that customer success it it certainly is a service um whether it's scaled or high touch and personal we're really trying to be consultants for the customers, but unlike other services professions, um, doctors, lawyers, teachers, um, half of the value behind our service is actually the product. So like it or not, we are actually the face of the product to the customer most of the time. And um, as you know, we all know, there's always good news and bad news that goes along with the job and what we need to share with the customer. So let's start with the good first. Um, can you describe some of the most enjoyable interactions that you have with customers? I'll start. Um, I think for me, the being in the product team now, it's the most enjoyable interaction is always going to be the delivery of a new feature or a launch of a new product. I think it's always exciting to be able to share all the hard work that our engineering design teams have put into it and be able to have the customers start utilizing these new features. So getting their feedback is really validating and just kind of reminds us of all the hard work that we're doing. So I think it's always really exciting whenever there's a big launch or even a small launch that maybe a customer submitted a feedback for and being able to close the loop on, hey, you requested this feature maybe a couple months ago. Now we have it live and we're so excited to get your feedback on and how we can continue to improve and build on the product. So.
Uh, I think for me, it's it's probably two things. It's one, just that, that the open discussion and the dialogue you can have with customers, even when they're complaining, the fact that they're, you know, they're opening up, I think, you know, I always, when, when CSMs ask about like customers that are talking about product feature requests that they've had for years and they're not super happy, you know, on the flip side, I'd much rather a customer share their frustrations and be talking with us and be entirely non-responsive at all because then we know nothing about them and we don't have any relationship there. Um, and then the other one, um, you know, Justin on my team, we had a meeting just today and we had our champion show up wearing our Octa t-shirt. So getting to see your customers show up to these like Zoom meetings wearing their swag um, is definitely personally validating. Yeah, I, I, I think Aman, uh, Amara is spot on. Like there's a spectrum between how you, what type of relationship you can have with the, a customer and like, a customer can be very complex with many different stakeholders, right? Like, let's just simplify it. On the one hand, it can be, uh, and there, there, there are companies that just run that way where it's a, a vendor customer relationship and that's how they run it, right? Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, it can be real true partnership where you're building things together and you're exploring what the pain points are. You're seeing like, what can we build to actually, and sometimes you build stuff that will, even blow up blow their mind that they haven't even thought about it's way better than what they're requesting right so it's like a partnership between it and without a doubt the the partnership one is the much more enjoyable one i personally find way yeah you're on the journey together it sounds like you're um balancing being a partner with the customer um and also kind of uh backing up what um where the product needs to go um you kind of alluded this to this already um amara i appreciated that you shared that you just value having an open discussion even if the customer is complaining about the product um when you're having these hard conversations um what does that typically look like and what are your strategies for navigating that yeah, um, I think first and foremost, like actively listening, you know, actively listening, giving your customer the, you know, their voice, to, especially when you're just beginning a meeting, um, making sure that they feel like they, that the vendor truly understands this, their situation, their and their impact to their business, um, and then empathizing with them, you know, like, again, like you may not have the solution that will get them out of the particular situation that they need or have any particular timeline for when you can deliver this for them. But just being able to empathize with them and to show them that you are, you know, listening directly to them, recapping what they said is the issue, I think can go a long way. Does anyone have any examples of hard conversations they've had in the past that they'd like to share? Yeah, I can take this one. I think um, a lot of folks can resonate, but especially now that I'm on the product team as well, um, saying no when a customer requests something, um, so especially when they're trying to solve a pain point, it can be an incredibly difficult conversation, especially if this customer is coming with a problem that they've been struggling with for a long time. And I think what's really important is that when you're having this difficult conversation of, all right, I have this customer with a problem, they have a feature request, I know the product team or the engineering team is not going to be able to work on it. How can I relay this back to the customer in a way that's not going to hurt my relationship with them or constrain them so that they don't become a churn risk? And I think being in customer success, we have a really unique opportunity where we can be very transparent with our customers. And I think it's sometimes taking the time to really walk them through why we're not saying no, but it can be a matter of, we can't work on this now because here are some other projects that we're working on. And I'm happy to walk you through the product roadmap to get you excited for other features that might also be of value to you. So you can understand why, unfortunately we can't do this feature request now, but it is something that our product team is always gonna be consistently reevaluating our priorities. And it might not align with our business goals now, but it's not a no in the future, if that makes sense. So I think really just being transparent and letting people know um, what the business is doing behind the scenes can really help open the customer's eyes for why we're just saying no to them now. I think the, the, the hardest the conversations are if you need to back up on any commitments that you made before, um, which can be the case even, you know, if you try to estimate it as best as possible and put the protection around it, but like, 
that can happen and in that in that situation i think it still goes the same be as transparent as you can explain why it is the case you know sometimes you can't because you know, maybe you know strategic decisions that you can't share at that point in time but be as transparent as you can and like um let them let them be heard and most of the time i think that will go a long way and they would be not happy about the situation but they will accept it And um, how do you go about preparing for a difficult conversation just around the corner? Get as much information as possible and prepare your call. <laughs> yeah, and, and be authentic. I think that also goes a long way, right? Nobody will, likes to talk to uh, a robot or a logo. Uh, we're all humans, so I think if you yeah, if you are authentic, that also helps. Um, have you ever considered and when is it appropriate to bring other stakeholders in the room as well? I mean, maybe Cindy can answer this one because I think she gets pulled into a lot of requests now. I have a suspicion. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, when bringing in other stakeholders, definitely it's it's good to have folks who are going to be on the call to help support you. But I think before bringing those stakeholders in, it kind of goes into your previous question, Grace, which is understanding the user problem. So I think before even bringing in the stakeholders or understanding like, okay, who do I want to invite on this next meeting with the customer? I really want to understand like what their problem is. So I think Steven is 100% correct in that you want to really ask like open-ended questions to make sure that like, is this a problem they've been having? How long have they been having this problem? What have we done already? Is there any workarounds that we've already provided to them. If not, you know, how do we kind of get them to a better place than they are today? And then once you kind of understand their problem, then you can go forth with, all right, it looks like they're having an issue with this specific area of our product. I wanna make sure that I can bring in the person that, you know, maybe worked on that feature or that person that is, you know, the domain expertise so that I can have them available on hand to help answer any questions or be able to reiterate like what we're gonna be doing to help alleviate some of the customer frustrations that they're having. So I think understanding the problem um, will kind of help the CSM decide whether or not it's appropriate to bring in the product, but it's always appropriate to bring in other stakeholders if they're not gonna have all the answers to the question. So I think that's always something to keep in your back pocket is that you'll always have internal resources who are willing to help you guide those difficult conversations. I love the internal collaboration that you're always seeking and the preparedness that you're trying to um, kind of navigate before having these customer facing situations. Um, and I'm curious to know when it comes down to it, kind of how do you pick who's, whose side you're on? Um, sometimes customers will correctly identify a gap um, that interferes with the outcomes that they want. And other times they might request something that is uh, maybe unreasonable or just like not al aligned with the long-term goals of the company. So how do you go about thinking through um, who to push for? Yeah, when I when I this is the one question when I saw the prep that I I was most excited about, but also like thinking about how do you answer this question? Um, I mean, I think, you know, first and foremost, you're an employee of your business, we're shareholders, right? And so you want to do the best to, you know, support your company that you're at. Um, that said, when you can, you know, when you have a customer who's vocal, um, you know, and is willing to share with you the information that they need to do more with the company. And you can also accurately validate and identify that this would help other customers and even, you know, prospective customers. Then you're getting to something that's beyond just your customer and a bigger issue. That is something that the, that the company should look to do. Um, so I think in, in that case, you know, number one is to remi remember that you're, you're always an employee of your company and you have to like find that fine line, but you know, especially at Okta, you know, we have a very strong customer first mentality. So we want to make sure that we're actively listening to our customers and getting them to share with us what they need to do more with our product. Um, when we have that information, we'll naturally be able to, you know, get more, get more customers, right? Um, so, yeah. Maybe I'm romanticizing it, but uh, I hope that the the goals of both the customer and the company are aligned in most cases, right? Because they buy from you 
because you build the best product, right? Uh, and uh, if they're a large enterprise, they also buy from you because if uh, uh, if you have a great transparent sales process, your roadmap and general vision is aligned with where they think it would add value to their business. So there might be disagreements on some features here and there, right? But in like long, broad and broad lines, I think there's a, there's an alignment that they buy from you because you build, you will build the best product and you have to you make the trade offs to build the best product, which will provide value for them over the long term. Yeah, I think that's definitely I agree with that. Ideally, you know, when you're doing it right, you can get both you can see alignment with both uh, customer and the business. But I think the reality is, as your company grows, and you start, you know, maybe you're expanding into certain verticals or expanding into different areas, you're going to have to make adjustments to your roadmap. And there are going to be some things that are going to be more relevant to one particular customer, one particular segment, and you just can't naturally do all of them. And I think as CSMs, our role is to be able to have that open, honest conversation with our customers, you know, pulling in additional resources or management is needed so that, you know, first and foremost, the customer does feel that their, their needs are met that we truly understand how we're impacting them, but we can also have a very realistic conversation of what, what we're doing as a company and why. Yeah, I really um, like that call out on um, segmentation. I think like from the personal relationship with customers, of course, they're gonna feel like they're the most important, but on the back end, we know that they're one of many and maybe like there's different targets that we're, um, accommodating when we're making these selections. So how do you go about thinking through um, which customers to prioritize um, in terms of their product requests and feedback? I think that's a, that's a very difficult uh, exercise and it's exactly why product managers being a product manager is such a difficult job. Uh, because you balance all of the factors, right? Customer requests, but if you only prioritize what customers are asking you, you might miss some big strategic uh, opportunities that uh, that you have in mind, right? So you need to balance all of those. Um, so I, I think for, from a su success lens or like a customer facing lens, the best that we can do is be as transparent as possible to the product organization and the rest of the organization in terms of like, what are the pain points that we're seeing? What are the trends? Um, what kind of value from paid customers or like which customers, which segments uh, are asking for it and provide that data in a, in a good, accessible, readable format. Um, and, and, and also put, put product and the people that make those uh, decisions in front and talk to these customers directly to understand the space as well. Um, and then, yeah, uh, they, they would have to make a difficult call And I think adding to what Stephen said, um, he's completely right in that, like in product, we're always making these very difficult decisions on prioritizing these trade-off decisions of doing something now versus later. And I think things that help, you know, the product team with making these decisions is that it's really important that, you know, when the customer success team is on the front lines, I think it's important for them to understand like what user personas are they kind of talking to and how does this feature or how does their request benefit those personas and what other personas is this, are we kind of working under or is our company kind of focused to catering towards because understanding the user personas will go a long way in helping us think about, all right, if we decide to do this, how does this further our business? Does it help us unlocking revenue? Does this help us retain the customer? Does this help us continue to grow forward as a company? Or is this a small enough request that it might help this one customer, but it's just not enough momentum for us to continue to scale and to grow? So I think being able to kind of resonate with the different types of personas that you're working with and translating that to the product team with, you know, whether it's an ARR attributed to the account or the fleet, or whatever you're working with, but to really help make them, help them guide these decisions that they're making on a daily basis is really important. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no worries. It's something that I, some, I, I'll advise CSMs is sometimes start backwards, like go to the PM first and ask them, what are you working on? And like, understand like some of the biggest chain, like challenges that they're facing that they need that information, right? It's different to go to someone and be like, my customer is escalating, my customer really wants this, but it, it doesn't tie into what the product managers are working on that they can actually devote the time. So, you know, so number one, I'd say, you know, for CSMs or here is like, you know, 
start backwards and go to the PM, you know, when you I've identified this is particularly relevant to the area that's a focus for your customer. Um, and then two, you know, when identifying is a customer that you're talking with, how to prioritize that their needs versus others. I'll typically assess based on the level of detail and the effort that the customer themselves goes into sharing the business case and their impact. When you have a customer that is putting the effort in and showing like, this is our process flow, this is our ideal state, and they're sharing this information with you, when you get like this long email full of details of like, this is why it's not working and this is what happened, that's different than a customer that's just complaining to be heard. Because that, I mean, the latter is a customer that's already putting in the level of effort that's needed for a product manager to validate, is this something that I should be focusing on and what resources, what a level of effort is expected. Yeah, I um, appreciate the call out on different um, customer personalities and also this give get relationship that we have with customers um, where they need to do a little bit of homework with our product to better define their needs. Um, to go off of that, are there common kind of customer personas that you're thinking through, you know, when you're handling these tricky conversations, how do you think about um, what kind of customer this typically is and how to have that interaction? You, you mean it a user or a customer that comes with feedback that they would like to have uh, prioritized? Yeah, exactly. Amara was sort of saying how some customers kind of dig in um, to do all the research to test things and other customers, maybe they're just like complaining to feel heard. Are there other pers like inner common um, pers personalities that you're interacting with? Uh, I think it really depends on your product and the industry that you're in, right? Like if you're more into a B2C type product, then uh, you always need to have some combination of qualitative and quantitative feedback talking to customers. But um, I, I would probably rely more on data uh, because there's more available in that sense, right? So I would like probably rely on that a lot. Um, and if you're in a true enterprise uh, company, it depends who you sell to, right? Maybe you're in cybersecurity and you sell to uh, chief information officers and, you know, so, and there are different levels of people that might use the product. So end users provide valuable feedback. I truly believe uh, in, in such a product where there are a lot of end users, their success will, is ultimately why the check gets signed. That's why they buy it, right? But you, you kind of need to look at it also more on a quantitative, Side to see is it the pattern how many people are actually um, uh, being affected by it or would unlock value uh, so like Cindy mentioned by implementing this feature right compared to if you talk to executive sponsors on the customer side it might just be a handful that you get to talk to right so it's more difficult to get uh, patterns on so I think it uh, it depends on the on the type of product market you're in and also like the different levels that you your product uh, might provide value and interact with. Yeah, it's always helpful to keep in mind that there's different, um, the customer is actually sitting in a different position in their own company and the way that we interact with them should be um, curated to their, um, maybe their level um, uh, that they're sitting in within their own company. So just shifting over a little bit um, to when you're actually, you know, siding with the customer um, in this situation and some of the next steps that you take internally. Um, we know that Customer success plays a really critical role in being the voice of the customer with our internal product teams. And um, what are some of the best practices that you have um, experienced and can share in terms of influencing the direction of these product decisions? I can, I'll share an example. Um, Okay, so when I started Okta, um, I was given three healthcare customers, right, at the same time. So one, I had to, they, particular customers and verticals can have very specific needs for their industry, right? And there was one particular feature need that they wanted that Okta did not have, but a competitor did for years. And so, you know, first I needed to, you know, understand 
uh, the specific need for them. I also, what helped in this situation is I was able to credentialize myself. You know, I was formerly pre-med in college. My mom's an anesthesiologist. So it's one thing when you're talking to a customer that has a particularly unique need to be able to just say like, hey, I get it. I understand why this is particularly important to you. Um, then you have to validate across other customers that this is also uh, something that's particularly important for them. So I had other healthcare customers saying the exact same thing. Um, and then, you know, look for internal champions as well, like other internal stakeholders that particularly care about the particular issue or maybe the, you know, the segment of customer that you're working on. And so I reached out to um, uh, one of our leaders and I said, hey, I have these, I have a situation here where I have all these healthcare customers, like who's focusing on healthcare? And he pointed me in this one direction. And so we had a, one of our annual conferences, Octane where I got to meet with my customer. And then I also had this other, you know, this other individual meet with them as well. And we basically just did like a full on interview where we listened to them talk through their use case. And, you know, we went back to our team internally, multiple different stakeholders. Um, and now that we have the right level of Intel, this is something that's truly impactful, not just for this customer, but many other existing customers and prospective customers. We're able to do the next step, you know, number three, which is building that business case. So, you know, as you're going to build that business case, understand that the product team is going to want to see, you know, what's really the true cost benefit of doing this now, right? Being able to quantify, um, you know, is this something that we can either do with our product today? Is this something that we want to pursue with a partner? Is this something that we want to, you know, is this even product related? In this particular case, it was a, com a combination of product and a compliance attestation that we needed to achieve. And so really having a full grasp of all the different, you know, things that are involved, um, understanding again, like what the overall cost would be, not just in terms of, you know, money, but resources, who, um, was able to, we were able to successfully build a get business case for them. And then we, we were able to deliver this feature. And you know, I think adding to what Amara has said, um, building a business case is extremely important, especially when you're, you're going to the product team with a request. And I think everyone always understand there's always a laundry list of things to do, whether it's feature requests, bug fixes, and you know, obviously other features that the team wants to prioritize to take the business to the next level. But I think ways to kind of help build your business case on top of just working with the customer to understand the problem is talking to your own internal team, ask other people like, hey, I have a customer request. Have you guys also heard a similar request before? And being able to utilize your own resources to continue to help build that case for why this feature is so not only important for this one customer that you're working for, but how much of an impact that that's going to have within you know, other fleets that also use that or may benefit from that feature as well. And I think it's also, it's always really important to keep in the back of your mind that when we're working on the product or building out a product, it, we're not trying to cater for every single use case because that's not humanly possible to have a, a one size fits all solution, but trying to find a solution that would fit the majority is going to be the most impactful to help making these decisions and moving the product towards um, adopting and making sure that whatever you ask for gets added to the roadmap. So. What, what I will probably do, and like there are all the standard things that uh, I think CSM should do just to like hygiene, like get it in the system where you might be tracking it, right? Attach it so that it, like it doesn't get for, forgotten. Um, I know many companies that might be not as mature and others might be messy, uh, but yeah, like just follow the processes that are laid out for that. The most impactful thing I'll probably try on that is to um, get product managers or whoever uh, can influence it in front of the customer and talk to them directly instead of just a story that gets put over email, right? Or in a conversation. So um, I would definitely do that. And as a CSM, you can probably also guess through what is some noise and what is not, right? Like what are the important ones and what is not? So I would also not with every little ask, go and try to find out, hey, what is the, you know, what's the status? Uh, or like, can we can we implement it on the roadmap? There are a few things that you probably have a gut feel on working with your portfolio that can be very important or, or game changes on, on a bigger scale. And if in a perfect uh, scenario, you like we're probably ahead of the customer, right? So you already 
um, I don't know, you fly with product managers to uh, a few customers in a certain industry and you meet them or like you have a customer advisory board, right? Or something where their needs are already surfaced uh, on a, in, in, a, in a, a regular way that there are already discussions on it. And there's this common language between product and, and CS about that, that dialogue that it's not a surprise that suddenly, oh, we want... X, Y, and Z, and uh, can we make it uh, next next quarter, right? Then kind of in a in a reactive mode on it. So that's probably what I will try get them in for, get get product and other stakeholders in front of the customer, talk to directly relate, uh, understand it, and then build a plan uh, on top of that. I'd love to dig in a little bit into that phrase of getting rid of the noise or just cutting through the noise. Is uh, there's a lot of requests that probably come our way. Um, have you had conversations with customers where, you know, it's not on the roadmap, it's not going to be on the roadmap, and you personally don't think it should be on the roadmap? So it's sort of a, a hard no type of conversation. And what does that, that look like? Yeah, so I keep trucking. Um, part of our product really focuses on compliance and making sure that when our users are using our products, they can remain in compliance and don't get in trouble with the law or anything like that. So Many times uh, people will try to come with a feature request that we simply can't do. And I think it's just being transparent and, hey, it's not that we don't want to build this feature because uh, we know it's going to be helpful for you, but we really can't do this because of, you know, this. there's a legal and regulatory component that prevents us from doing so. And then even going as far as like, here's, you know, the, the regulation that states why we can't do this and sharing that with people and then letting them go, oh, I didn't know about that regulation or, oh, I didn't know that you couldn't do this because of this reason kind of really helps uh, stamp and provide more uh, depth to the conversation and letting them know like why something is impossible to do. I think it's a sign of respect. If you know that's already the case, right? It's not going to be on their decision. Just be transparent about it and they can make uh, their decisions. Uh, what, what they're going to do is a plan B potentially, right? But I'm personally not a fan of just keeping customers lingering and saying, yeah, we're thinking about it. And like, well, you know that it's, it's not going to happen in a reasonable amount, you know, amount of time. Yeah, I'd echo that 100%. I think especially, you know, when you have something that is escalated to, you know, the executives of your customers, the executives just want to know definitively, like, is this going to be prioritized or not? You know, if you can't get them any like clarification on the timeline, it's just better to say it's not prioritized right now and, and give them that time and opportunity to either, you know, build something themselves or look for something else until it is. Um, but meanwhile, you know, always, you know, trying to highlight the positive, reminding them the successes that they are experiencing to date, looking for some quick wins that are going to be prioritized in the near term, I think can go a long way to not just getting a customer to feel like, you know, they're, we're not listening to them. We're not, you know, we're not delivering things that they need. Yeah. On, on the other end, Grace, because you said, you said this is about something that you know for sure is not going to happen, right? But there are a lot of cases where I think there might be um, like projects to investigate certain areas, right? Or like there's no decision made, you're going to invest in it or not. And I think you can be transparent around that as well. There might not be a timeline, right? But I'm sure that there are a lot of product managers that are then very interested in talking to customers to have their needs. But then it is quite tricky and it is uh, um, Im important for the CSM and the rest of the account team uh, to set expectations and say like, oh, this is exploratory because I've also seen that they just take that as, a, uh, as an input, like, oh, they're talking to us and they're gonna build exactly what we are asking for, right? So you need to set the stage and have to, just have to yeah, clarify that uh, a few, few times. I love um, kind of wrapping up the panel discussion on that note, um, just to be really empathetic with all the customer feedback, just because it's not on the roadmap for the foreseeable future. Maybe it's worth further investigating for sure. Um, I would love to kind of transition into the Slido questions in the audience. If you didn't get a chance to go ahead and upvote um, the questions that you'd like to surface to the panel. And um, I'll just um, pull out some questions from here. Um, 
Um, Eric asks, what are some tools or strategies that you use to provide consistent and relevant communications to your customers when you have a really large book of business? I think when I was a CSM managing a large book of business, it would be really helpful to utilize like templates in Gmail or Salesforce or whatever integrations that you have. And um, especially when you're trying to reach a large volume of people, having these templates for you know announcing a new feature release or giving them an update on the business will be really helpful because you can just plug in the template once, select the people you want to send it to, fire it off at the time that you want. And then you have all these touch points that you've now um, made with without having to do much work of manually going towards each individual book of business you have and trying to reach out to them. So I think utilizing like shortcuts like that in Gmail or whatever MailChimp that you use today would be really helpful in helping reach a large audience. It's uh, It's been a while, but what, what I would probably do in the situation is um, be hyper organized and try to uh, prioritize rather than do as much as possible across all of those customers. So I would probably first take or organized time on my calendar to go through and you need systems without a doubt, right? For like both, like seeing like maybe you use Gainside or a similar type of tool, right? Like have just a big list with visibility into all the uh, metrics and, and, and information that you have about those customers and then think carefully about where are you going to spend your time because if you have a really big book of business you're never going to have enough time to interact with all of them all the time right so it's more a question of what where can you intervene as a human to contact them right that you're going to have a really good result um, and you, you know sometimes it might be uh, that there's definitely a certain campaign and uh, 600 customers or whatever could, could benefit from it. And then you definitely can use tools like uh, Groove or there are a ton of automation tools on emails and templating like Cindy, and then you can leverage those. But I would, I would probably spend more time prioritizing and thinking it through than doing the actual uh, uh, outreach. Yeah. Um, so our, our team manages like enterprise accounts, but I can give my perspective as a manager, you know, who's been a CSM, you know, you might need to be able to surface this to your, to your management or leadership. It could be that, you know, your, your processes and tools have outgrown the book, you know, what's actually feasible and scalable for you to do. And so if you're hearing the same thing from other CSMs, like feel empowered to share this with your leadership, and it might be, you know, worth, worth them evaluating other tools that will help you manage your day-to-day. -day. Uh, another kind of question related to systems. Um, oftentimes there's a lot of feature requests from larger enterprise customers. Um, they're the ones that get prioritized with respect to what makes sense uh, and makes it to the product. What's the best way to escalate these requests for SMB or mid-market? Do you have any tools or ideas to help with this? I think this is very depending on the type of organization that you're working at, like what Stephen was talking about before. But um, normally, if you have like a formal process where you submit product feedback, um, that would be a great place to start because you just want to start bucketing and categorizing, especially when you're working with SMB and much smaller um, type of clients. It's good to build volume to try to get that AR impact for, hey, you know, this is not just a request from one customer, but this can have a huge impact for this much majority of customers. I can validate that by going into, you know, my product requests, whether it's on Google Sheets or Coda or Jira or whatever um, platform that your company might use, but just really trying to get, make sure that you can provide the ARR impact tied to all those fleets and really make sure that that can be part of how, when you talk to product and going to them with that information is really helpful and, and critical. Other thoughts, Stephen or Amara, or I can move on to the next question. I, I think I think uh, Cindy Cindy covered it right, and I don't. It depends on the company if there are big customers uh, that dictate feature requests, right? Like it can be company strategy or not. It doesn't have to be that way, right? So I think you, as a company, also need to decide like what what, what is our strategy 
do we, I don't know, tailor just to those very large customers and are they extremely important for us to keep on board or do we build things that, you know, could, could, could benefit the SMB as well? So uh, it kind of, kind of depends the culture and decisions uh, of the company, but uh, it doesn't have to be that way. And if it's more volume based, like SMB uh, type customers, it definitely comes back to what are the patterns and, uh, um, you know, can you make a can you make a case across multiple uh, customers and the impact on the segment rather than individual customers? Uh, yeah, that brings to mind um, Amara's whole point around building the momentum for feedback, uh, multiple customers finding those internal champions. Maybe that's the best route for um, the smaller customer accounts. Um, another question: SES, when you're caught in the middle between the customer and some product gaps that they're asking for, it can be very stressful. Do you have any tips on how not to take things personally or just get too stressed out? And what can you do? The product gaps, you try to do your best. At the end of the day, you need to relax, have a glass of wine. <laughs> Tomorrow, new day. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I mean, I think you'd have to just find a work-life balance that works for you and, you know, get suggestions from others and just find out how they are staying kind of like afloat with things like, you know, whether it's just trying out new hobbies outside of work that will get you to, you know, because you'll also probably find yourself more invigorated for when you do have those tough situations. Um, and I also, you know, I'll tell CSMs as well, like, you know, get starting off meetings with a positive note and getting people just like happy and excited and laughing and ideally smiling will usually diffuse some of their, you know, frustrations and concerns. It's not, you know, you can't, you know, throw it under the rug, but um, bringing in again, that energy and that positivity um, can usually influence people to really try to show up and be their best possible selves, even when they're having to have difficult conversations. And I think echoing off of what Amara said, like being positive and always looking at, you know, what's to come and getting excited about, you know, maybe we're not doing something now and like I have no influence over this, but we're doing so much more amazing work and we have so much down the pipeline that will also continue to benefit our users and, and keeping that positive attitude is really critical to just, you know, having a positive work life balance and everything that everybody else has touched on already. Awesome. Sounds like, you know, have a glass of wine and stay positive, kind of ask others how they're handling these situations. Sounds like the best way to go. I'm a big fan of getting some sun, go to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone will know, like I can always be found in the sun and I'm happy. So if I have customers in sunny areas, doesn't matter what they're telling me, I'll still be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, with that, um, we have uh, kind of four minutes back for everyone to kind of resume their meetings. I wanted to give a big thank you for our panel today. Um, it's been so helpful digging into this topic with all of you. Um, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, have a great day or evening. Thanks everyone. Thank mm -hmm. you.